Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davidge, and I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, the DeKalb County Public Library, and the DeKalb Library Foundation, welcome to another in our continuing series of virtual author events. We are so very pleased, though, this evening for this particular event because it is the launch of the new book by Kimberly Jones and Geely Siegel, Why We Fly. A few things before we get started this evening, I would like to remind you that after the formal presentation and chat, if you would like to ask a question of any of our panelists, please feel free to do so by typing your question into the Q&A feature. You can locate that by finding the Q&A button located at the top or the bottom of your screen, depending on your device. We've also enabled live transcription for our hearing impaired patrons who need that our service. You can locate the live transcription by finding the CC button at the top or bottom of your screen, and you can resize the font to make yourself the most comfortable to see the transcription appearing at the bottom of your screen. I would also like to thank Brave and Kind Books, our bookseller this evening. They are Dictator's independent bookstore that are black owned and mom run. We would encourage you as we have done the entire pandemic to support any of your local independent bookstores wherever you may be. They've been so vital to the community and especially our black owned independent bookstores because if we truly want a diverse and just society, we need to support them as well. We are so very pleased this evening, of course, because Kim and Geely have been fantastic supporters of the library and the Center for the Book for quite some time now. And they have provided us with wonderful programming and a few jokes at the same time. Of course, I'm Not Dying With You Tonight was named one of the books all Georgians should read. And we are so very pleased to have them for this follow-up to that book. Of course, it's about senior year, star quarterbacks, cheer squad, mounting college pressures that test the lifelong friendship of its two main characters, Eleanor and Chanel. They are going to be joined this evening by moderator, Bria Baker, who is an activist, writer, impact advisor, and speaker. She was a student activist who in 2017 was the youngest organizer for the 2017 Women's March. And for her efforts in that, she was recognized by Glamour Magazine as a woman of the year. She has her bachelor's degree in political science from Yale University, where she served as the president of the Yale University's NAACP chapter. Her writing has appeared in Elle, Harper's Bazaar, Parade, Refinery29, and other publications. So please find her at her website, which we will also drop into the chat, and you can peruse what she does there as well. But right now, I would like you to welcome these three talented and powerful women, Bria Baker, Kimberly Jones, and Gilly Siegel. Bria? Thank you so much, Joe. That was the most beautiful introduction. Kimberly, Gilly, I am so excited to be talking with y'all tonight. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I am literally honored to. I think the biggest thing that's been getting me through, excuse me, I think the biggest thing that's been getting me through the pandemic have been books. I'm reading nonstop. And so it was such a joy to also especially break up some of the nonfiction I've been reading, um, but still touch on something that was connected to what was happening in the world outside. So thank y'all for this labor of love. I'm super, super excited to talk about it. Um, to kick us off, I would love to hear about how you all came to work together. This is your second book together. Um, and so maybe you can share the story of how you came to working together and um, your favorite parts of working with each other. She bullies me, Bria. This is <laughs> she woman handled me into being her partner. Yes. As a Gemini, I, I love that energy. <laughs> I, I am bossy and I own it. If you call me bossy, I'm going to take it as a compliment. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh. Tell them how you woman handled me into this <laughs> partnership. So Kim and I met six or so years ago. We were in a book club together for adults who read young adult novels. Um, and 
uh, we, we were friendly, but not such, we'd like discovered all this stuff that we had in common. We're both single moms. We were both, you know, trying to balance creative side hustles with day jobs, but we weren't such close friends that we had each other's phone number or anything. And then, um, I saw a news clip that inspired the idea for our first novel together. And I knew it wasn't a story I could tell by myself. And I really wanted to write with Kim because I admired her and I loved her. And also she's hilarious. And so, um, at the time she was the manager of a bookstore and, and um, I'm a lawyer by trade. I'm still a lawyer. That's my day job. And so I like argue people into things for a living. And I was like, all right, I'm going to argue her into doing this with me. And I went to the store when I knew she was on shift because I didn't have her phone number and I had my bullet points ready to go. And I was like, all right, here we go. And I lurked around the store waiting for her to go on break to the point that the staff was like, is this a lady a problem? Do we need to call somebody? Yeah. And Kim was like, no, no, I know her. And um, she finally went on break and I started to rattle off my bullet points to convince her to write this story with me. And I got about two bullet points into it and she goes, stop right there. And I, you know, like all the blood drained out of my head. And I was like, oh, this is a terrible idea. She hates it. She hates me. And what she actually said was, you had me and let's write together. And we've been writing together ever since. So you weren't bullied. You were strongly <laughs> encouraged. <laughs> yeah. I'm into it. Yes. <laughs> it feels like yes. such an alignment moment, you know, to have met one another through a book club and then to be so successful at writing YA together, um, but doing it in a way that I think brings such a nuance to conversations that are happening at a national scale that adults are having as well, um, but that young people are often not getting the space to talk about it. So how did you decide uh, the subjects that you were going to touch on and specifically to explore that like dynamic of friendships between people who are not of the same racial or cultural background? Um, I think it started because we would read these articles. Both, both of our stories were inspired by actual events. And we would read these articles about young people finding themselves in very difficult situations or young people making extreme sacrifices. Um, and we were inspired by them. Interestingly enough, the inspiration for why we fly, um, actually we had started working on it. We, you know, we had this idea and we had started working on it. And then in 2017, um, when we first started working on it, there were the Kennesaw State cheerleaders. Those were the cheerleaders who took a knee um, at their football game at their college and they suffered severe consequence. Um, initially, they just didn't allow them to take a the field, but eventually many of them lost their scholarships. And so again, talking about alignment, Geely and I were talking about doing this story. We were reading all these articles about the Kennesaw State cheerleaders. We were inspired by them. And there was an anti-violence um, rally that was happening in Atlanta that I was helping to coordinate and put together. And I got there and one of my partners had gotten the Kennesaw State cheerleaders to come march with us. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So I, I immediately I text Geely and I was like, you're not gonna believe who's here. And she was like, who? And I was like, the Kennesaw State cheerleaders. <laughs> and so I got to like talk to them and meet them. And I was so inspired by these young women. And Gilly is a researcher. So then she went down like a rabbit hole and found like every interview they had done. And then she, you know, she Gilly has found a hundred years of athletes and activism while we worked on this book that she has documented and pulled together for us to pull from. And so a lot of times our stories are kind of ripped from the headlines. I mean, I'm not dying with you tonight came out of a headline we saw about um, during the murder of, um, of uh, during the civil unrest in Baltimore um, after the death of the murder of Freddie Gray about this group of young people who the, who the city basically trapped behind police lines, if you will, during the protests. And that's what's inspired I'm Not Dying With You Tonight. So we are watching young people live these experiences and we're just trying to utilize our books to give space for conversation for, about it. Mm -hmm. Gilly, do you wanna to touch on that or piggyback in any way? Yeah, I mean, young people are at the center of these conversations, but the media overlooks it, right? Unless you actively work with young people, it's real easy to dismiss them. And a lot of times when we talk to teens, what they say is, 
we just want to be heard, right? We want people to listen to us. We are inheriting this mess y'all have made. Um, listen, listen to what we're saying. And I, the giving them a centering them um, is a really important part of what Kim and I do. And then the other piece of that, of course, is there, is, there are, you know, there's more than a hundred years of activism that we found. Actually, we found an instance of cheerleaders at Brown University taking and sitting during the national anthem in 1973. So it's like every mm -hmm. generation looks at these moments where people speak up and step out and face really severe consequences for what they do. And it's like, whoa, this is the first time it's ever happened. And it's right. like, no, it's maybe just the first time you're paying attention to it and you have to interrogate why that is. Mm, that's such a good point. I love that. I also love that because the book is based on so much research, there's a, it's similar to like historical fiction, except, you know, building on the present, eventually it will be historical fiction. Um, but I think that idea that you're really just exploring what's happening in a current day and just giving, you know, giving yourself more creative license to weave that story in a way that, that, uh, expands the conversation. I'm curious, you both are mothers, how motherhood has impacted the way that you write these stories and in the reverse, how writing these stories has changed the way that you mother. Oh, that's, that's a good question. I, you know, it's funny. I would like, I would turn that back on our kids. It's interesting how us writing these stories have impacted our kids. Um, we both have teenagers and Geely's daughter has participated in her own personal and private protest at school. Um, my son just did a full basically dissertation at his school about critical race theory using my speech as his backdrop. Um, and they're 15 and 14. Uh, my son's 15, Geely's daughter's 14. You know what I mean? And so I think that it has had an impact on them. And I think the way in which it has had an impact on our parenting is that we continuously have these conversations with them and we utilize um we utilize the space in which we work um to say okay let's have these conversations let's see how you're feeling about this and it also allows us to be in a privileged position if you will that when our kids take these stances we're like no you I can't be your mother and not support you in this protest I can't be your mother and not not support you in, in this dissertation that you choose I I honestly I was telling you the other day for a long time, I would kind of try to tell my son, like, it's okay if you don't want to tell the world I'm your mom. You don't need to, you know, carry the burden of having me as your mother. And his response to that was to do a whole report on me. <laughs> so, like, what are you talking about? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, also, how does it impact us as authors? Listen, no one will keep you real like teenagers, especially your own teenagers, if you are raising them. So a lot of times we will rely on our kids to be like, what about this? Do the kids say this these days? And they'll be like, no, uh, -uh you sound like a 43 year old lady. Stop it. <laughs> so, you know, there it's a, I, I like to think it's a symbiotic relationship, but, but who knows? They may be sitting downstairs in my living room being like, oh God, her again. No, I'm sure that it's not that, as you said, they're going to keep it all the way real and they wouldn't have let it go to print without being like, wait, I cannot have this going into the world yep. um, this way. So shout out to that. I love, I love that part of the process because I feel like sometimes we get to a place where people are speaking to kids, to teenagers, to young adults without knowing them and without bothering to build that relationship. And then you can feel that in the language. So it's just very clear that that's not the case with you too and that you've been really intentional about it not just being like, how do I get, you know, like trying to like, how do I teach you to eat vegetables? And it's, it's the like, okay, let's, let's have an honest conversation about what it would take for this book to really resonate and to, to be meaningful. Well, thank you. Oh yeah, y'all nailed it. So um, at the top of this Zoom call, um, I think Kim, you mentioned um, just the, the deep sacrifices that that Kennesaw uh, cheerleading team faced when they took those actions. And I do think that that's something that gets underestimated with youth activism. There's this aspect of people feeling like it's gimmicky, um, but in reality, when young people take a stand, um, they really do put a lot on the line um, I have a follow-up question already for this, but I just want to start right there and just say, how have you seen that, whether in your research with your own children um, and, and, you know, just how, how did you see that in a real life way that made you see like, this is the way that this book needs to go? 
Yeah, we we definitely see it that way. And and that's part of why we set the book the year that we sit it in. We we put the book in 2019 because there was all of this like performative fake kumbaya that happened after the civil mm-hmm. rest of the civil unrest of 2020, where now all of a sudden, you know, the NBA was painting Black Lives Matter on the floorboard and the NFL owners were taking a knee with their players and all of this stuff that we were like boy, if you don't sit down with that phony baloney macaroni. Right. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Colin Kaepernick is still on the National Football League. That part, that part. Mm -hmm. Um, And people remember it wrong. Like people always remember it. It's, It's funny because, you know, it's like Dr. Martin Luther King. People always want to invoke King's name when they don't like something and talk about, well, why can't they just peace to protest peacefully like King? Well, that's what Colin was doing. Y'all didn't like that either. So your expectations are whack and it's phony baloney. And so that's why we said it in 2019 because we wanted to show an we wanted to leave an authentic imprint of what it looked like when it was unpopular at the height of it being a single conversation because that's really what happened with the civil unrest of 2020 is that black america was having a a conversation a single conversation and nobody was engaged in the conversation and when everyone was stuck in the house in the pandemic um the they had to have the great awakening of oh my god this is all so horrific and it's like it's been horrific since forever hello <clears throat> yeah it's been a long few centuries mm-hmm. yep yeah i mean you need look no further than the kennesaw state cheerleaders who were booted from the field they their scholarships were stripped from them they're in litigation to this day over what happened to them oh. um, but i think one of the most striking examples of it to me is uh the 1968 olympics with john carlos and tommy smith yes. so i grew up in the 80s right and i remember the photo of them on the podium with peter norman who's the who's the white guy on the podium with them as this iconic image that was celebrated as empowerment, right? Like we're so proud of this moment in civil rights history. But when you look at what actually happened to them at the time, um, John Carlos and Tommy Smith were sent home from the Olympics days later in disgrace. Their medals were stripped from them. For years, they could not earn a living as runners, as athletes, because the USOC ostracized them. Um, And Peter Norman, the third guy who didn't raise his fist because it wasn't the right thing for him to do, but he supported their action. He was a pariah in Australia as late as 2000. um, When the Sydney, when Sydney hosted the Olympic Games, he was not invited to the opening ceremony. So we get collective and you get it you put it in the chat right we get amnesia about what it was like in that moment in time but the moment that an athlete activist is not supporting the status quo right the power hegemony status quo they are ostracized um from then until now i mean even in this most recent olympics there was back and forth with the um international olympic committee about whether black lives matter signage was going to be allowed exactly and i was like you guys we were literally in this movie in 1968 y'all remember how it came out for you oh you don't you've forgotten Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they, they were in that in the 1930s they with, with Jesse Owens. They, they never quit being in that party. Right, one million percent. And that goes to not even just the amnesia, but also um, the way that school curriculums are, like not even just like conveniently, like intentionally blocking those lessons out so they're not being passed on and so it feels novel each time. And that's why I think that it's so important for for literature like this, for books like this to exist in the world, because it's a more accessible way for young people to realize the legacy that they're a part of. Um, and I just, I really, I love that that it went there. So now the next piece though, is that it not just explored the stake that youth organizing and that athlete organizers take, but also the way that that even amongst those who take the stand, that can be discriminate based on your race and how, you know, they, you know, I don't want to give too many things away to those who have not read it, but how much can you tell us about that part of the storyline and why it was important to talk about that, uh, that, you know, separate lived reality that even when we're in solidarity with one another, some of us have even more on the line than others. Yeah, I thought it was, I thought it was super, um, it's, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that because that's one of the like criticisms we've seen in reviews um, with the book was that they were saying, well, you know, there was the obvious choice that they made that the black, the black girl had a, had a 
you know, a harder road to go after making this decision. And I'm like, it's not obvious. It's honest. It's <laughs> anything else would have been a dishonest storytelling. And it would have been a, you know, propping up that, you know, white uh, savior trope. I think it was so important for y'all to do that and to make it clear to allies, like what it means to really be in solidarity is to even acknowledge how much more other people are putting on the line to do it. So I, I didn't mean to answer your question for you, but I'm like, I didn't know people were critiquing that. I loved that choice. I just felt like face was all the answer I wanted to give. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Um, I will, it was intentional, right? It was intentional. It shouldn't be new news to anybody that Black students are disproportionately punished for disproportionate acts. Um, but to the extent that it is, you know, yes, like, and I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say Nellie is disproportionately punished, right? She's, um, she's uh, singled out as an instigator for an action that she really, she didn't. And her, and her supposedly best friend fails her. Like, this is also part of the book is to explore what's the difference between an ally and an accomplice. And what is, you know, Lenny willing to put on the line? What does she understand that she needs to put on the line? And she's not there yet, right? She, she fails. She makes mistakes, which is also intentional right because we are going to make mistakes on this journey and um, we have to be able to acknowledge that they happen and learn from them and do better next time um, as opposed to pretend that they they never happened and shy away afterwards yeah mm. oh I think that's uh it's so important because uh, we could I feel like we could talk about this for days but I just think it's so important to model too not just what it means to be an accomplice, but also what it means to be a friend. Like, I think sometimes we try and make things harder than they are. And the reality is like, what does it mean to really be a ride or die, to really show up for this community that you're saying that you're in allyship with, that you're, you're not just their ally or their accomplice, but hopefully you're building a relationship where you are a friend and you can examine like what it takes um to build those sort of like multiracial friendships too which is again something i love about both of the books so um love that that was an intentional choice i'm seeing there's some good um action going in the comment section definitely please continue interacting but also drop some questions i have a few more but then i want to jump into some questions from y'all in the audience um so please 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 drop your questions in the chat so that we can see them and so that we can get gilly and kimberly um interacting with those but do you have copies of the book in front of you um if not either way you can either answer this with what was your favorite part of the book like what is your favorite plot piece or if you have a specific excerpt that you want to read out we'd love to give you a chance to do that as well um so either your favorite part of the book uh or your an excerpt that you actually just want to read out verbatim well, if you have an excerpt you want to read, because clearly I'm here in my luxurious car, but I can tell you, what, <laughs> um, I can tell you what my favorite part of the book is. My favorite part is when we get introduced to Aunt Rhonda, because when I tell you Aunt Rhonda reads that whole room for filth, that was my favorite thing to write. I was like, I want to write the read that was heard around the world, and because I think it's important that those of us um who are a little spunky if you will are there in a in allyship with young people right so a lot of times we talk about you know we talk about what it means to be an ally for someone culturally but what we don't talk about is the intergenerational conversations and support that we need to be having what it looks like if you want to get the 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 name the cool aunt that cannot just come from buying cute jackets and buying ice cream you need to be an ally to that child to their lived experience to their growth and development and be in support of the decisions they make even if those decisions are inconvenient for you but are best served for them and so I think for me, that's what Aunt Rhonda represents. She represents someone who steps in and say, no, this is not going to be an easy road for these kids making these decisions. But what kind of character are we building if we don't support and nurture them through it? How do we prepare them for survival in this life? How do we prepare them for the ills of the world and give them the emotional maturity it's going to take by modeling it for them in these moments? And maybe they have the ambition, but they don't have the words 
but baby, I'm, I'm on T and I got the words and I'm gonna handle this. Don't you worry. And you're going to learn how to handle it by watching because kids don't do what we say. They, they do what they see us do. So how are you modeling? Like, how are you modeling showcasing good character and substance and stand up for kids? And I think, I think that first time we see Aunt Rhonda, she's just a down. I love that you referred to it as the read heard around the world. I love that. And again, it's honest, right? Like some of us are going to be, you know, um, concise with our words and we're going to have prose and we're going to be able to be orators. And some of us are going to keep it real. And we need both of that, right? We need to acknowledge mm -hmm. that we're going to deliver it in different ways, um, but we have something to add to it. And there, as you said, there's a role and a lane for the Aunt Rondas of the world. So I love that. What about you, mm -hmm. Gilly? Um, I think one of my favorite parts to write was actually um, Lenny and Three's relationship. This is again, sort of that theme of imperfection and making mistakes and fumbling your way through first experiences in life. And I don't know that either of them does a real mature job of handling the relationship. And I think it's interesting to be like, are they, you know, do, do they really love each other? Or was this sort of a high school romance? One of my favorite parts in the book, which actually my daughter did not like, she was like, it was really mean. Um, I really love the moment so they're sort of spoilery. Sorry, guys. Um, there's a moment when when Bull, who's a side character, a friend of Three's, um, sets Lenny straight about what's going on between them. And I think we all need Bull is our soothsayer. Um, and I we all need that person in in our life who's like, you know what? You need to hear the harsh truth um, so you can learn your lesson. So that actually, even though it's kind of a mean moment, that's one of my really favorite parts of the whole book. I love that. I love that. And again, like it, you need the different perspectives that um, really ground, you know, the the takeaways of the book and where it's not coming off preachy, um, right? Or like a 43 year old is saying it, but you give opportunities for the characters to say the things that y'all are thinking and that y'all are like, okay, but we can't let it go unchecked because we do need readers <laughs> to know what is and isn't okay. You know what I mean? Are yeah. there any other creative choices y'all took that even if others in the industry um, don't always agree with it or whatever the case may be, but where you're like, no, it's important that we, that we are honest in this way or that we um, use creative tools in, in that way. It's, you know, were there any explicit choices that you took to make sure that the moral of the story got across for y'all? I have one from this book and then I maybe want Kim to tell hers from the first book like of an unpopular choice that we made because mine was in my um I'm brave brave because of Kim right like I'm inspired by her bravery she makes me brave so Lenny is Jewish in this book and um oh I'm sorry I'm about to get us in some trouble Kimberly <laughs> um we read a lot of books about dead Jews and tr Jews and trauma um <laughs> Uh, like we really, and not that they're not important, right? Like Holocaust stories are important and, and sort of moments of trauma are really important, but so are sort of people like, and not just Jewish, but what your, the role that your faith community, if you belong to one plays in your daily life and, and whether it's helping you on your journey and how it interacts. And, um, it was hard, it was a hard choice to, I am Jewish and to have Lenny be Jewish and Jewish like me, right? So she's reform and her community is an incredibly part of her life, but she's not particularly religious. And it was like, I don't know if anybody's going to want to read about a Jewish girl like this, but this is the Jewish girl I wanted to see on the page when I was growing up. And so I'm going to put her and Kim was like, that's our story then. Cause, and she, she, she gave me the courage to do it. Mm. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I was like, girl, you put on that page in an office. Hey, screw these people. The people who are going to be with it, going to be with it. And the ones who are not, are not. And we we got to move on with life. We, if we, let me tell you something. You are not, you are not successful if you are loved by all. And I, I believe that. I'm talking about when you're doing this type of work. You are not, you are only dangerous when what you do threatens the status quo. And if you're bucking oppression and Yes. Them, ain't that what you're supposed to be doing? That's exactly what right. you're supposed to be doing. That's and you know, 
Yeah, and that, you know, and it's funny because that was the stance that we took in the first book, and I'm not dying with you tonight. We had a lot of conversations about it, and I, I said to Geely, are you okay with rocking with me on this? Because they're not going to like the fact that I have Alina speaking AAVE. They particularly are not going to like the fact that I have her speaking AAVE against Campbell speaking in, you know, alleged proper English that's going to be an issue and it and in some of the first reviews that's that's what people's issues were um with a lot of people that's what their issue and it's funny because I did a book club recently and that's what they said they were like well I've heard enough of the ghetto girl trope I don't understand why we have to yeah. keep writing that. I'm, and I'm like you have seen it on television poorly depicted and not three-dimensional right. you right. have not seen in literature, you have not seen it done as a three-dimensional person. And I said, the fact that we are telling young girls who are growing up in marginalized neighborhoods that they will only, they are only good enough if they aspire to be like someone else, that who they are yeah. as they are is not good enough. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, Black girls, particularly hood girls, are the architects of cool. We teach everybody what to say, what to wear, what is cool. The, the language they want to call AAVE is American English. It is so integrated into the fabric of this language that you don't even know when you're using it anymore. So the last time that you stood in front of an audience and said, put your hands together, I bet you don't know that that came from, from slang from the jazz era. I bet you don't know that saying cool comes from the slang of the 70s. I bet you don't even know. I bet I have you recognized that bling is now in the in the dictionary from a song right. from Little Wayne from Little Wayne. So to me, as these girls are creating the culture and not just black culture, but well, American culture, yeah. are, as they are deliciously in the act advent of the language the street style that everyone mimics we tell them that they are less than we tell them that they're not good enough we tell them that who they are is not what they should be and they should be aspirational to be a bootstrap black girl that pulls herself back up and i just wanted to write a book for little girls to let them know hood girls can be heroes too i'm a hood girl ah yes Hood Girls Can Be Heroes too. I think sounds like the title of y'all's next book, to be honest, but that is like that right there is so, so powerful. And I love that both of you were committed to writing characters that didn't lean into those tropes and those expectations, but that are really honest. And, and I think so many will see themselves in those characters and see that honesty of like, yes, like, you know, not all of us are the buttoned up and we're doing this. And, and as you said, bootstrap, it's so important to not see these characters watered down in a way that encourages these young girls to water themselves down or to be someone else or to aspire to something else. That's so, so important. And the comment section is, is going off in agreement. Like you just have a sermon, <laughs> pass around an offering plate or something. Drop a some cash whatever, but yes, yes, yes. Um, See, everybody's saying it. So I think we have the assignment for book three. Um, <laughs> before I jump into some of the, uh, actually, no, let's jump into some of the questions from the from the panelists. Um, so uh, someone, Shelly, asked um, a little while ago, how do both of you get past the hard times in the publishing process, reviews, delays, et cetera, to enjoy the work and the message that you are giving. And I think this is going to especially be true because you can compare this process to your last book writing process and, and the fact that you're releasing a book in the middle of a pandemic, you likely were finishing up this book in the middle of a pandemic. And so what? how, how have you gotten through the hurdles enough to really smell the roses and see how much the impact is going to be? Well, um, our very first trade review ever was an absolute terrible review. It dragged us. It dragged the book. It was basically like, you would be better off using this book as toilet paper. And, and uh, yeah, so, so that was bracing. And then not long after it came out, we had the good fortune to meet an extremely well-known young adult author, um, Lori Hals Anderson. And we sort of 
word vomited to her how bad it, we felt. And she was like, you know what? And she's, if y'all know her, I'm, YA fans in the crowd will know her. She wrote Speak and an, another sort of got an incredible um, canon of work. She said, Kirk has panned my third book <laughs> and, and said her career started so promising comma but and then she said a bad word she said f carcass um <laughs> and you know what we were both she like embraced us and and it was like here's this icon who's like don't pay any mind to that you tell the stories that you were meant to tell and they will find the people that need them and um uh, you know that was like an incredible entree into the publishing world because it was like there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs and this is a the art is subjective there will be people who think you hung the moon and there will be people who are like mm -hmm good grief, who let them write a book? Um, and you kind of just have to do your thing and and block that stuff out, right? You like have to put on your, your noise canceling headphones and do your work. Yeah, and we have a cheat code because it's two of us, right? So it's like, I might be having a really bad day and feel like, woe is us. Oh my mm -hmm. God, we should not go on. This is not for us. Um, but then Geely might be having a good day that day and be like, no, sis, we got this. We can do this. We're okay. Right. It's going to work. It's going to be fine. And then those days flip. There are days when she is like, I quit. I'm sick of it. And I'm like, no, we're so close. We just got to like, hold on. So we have been blessed that, you know, this journey has been you know, we've, we've had a partner who understands it on a very intimate level because it's, you know, they're not talking about my friend's book. It's our book. You know, they're right. not, they're not, you know, Geely's not, you know, Geely's not like, oh, you'll be okay, Kim. Cause she's like, oh, I gotta be okay too. It's my book, you know? And so, um, you know, it just makes it easier. We both right now are writing like our first solo books and it's, I'm, I'm nervous about what that looks like to navigate the world without her because I'm used to having that. We have a system. I, you know, I proudly talk about it. I'm not ashamed about it. Um, I am, I'm neurodivergent, which I think makes me a superhero, but that's another mm -hmm. conversation. But, um, but you know, I'm neurodivergent. And so I, I, I have moments where I start ticking, where the day has been too long for me, where the conversations have been too many for me. And she knows that. And she, she can look at me and she can tell when I'm, she can tell when I'm ticking, when I'm winding down and she'll be like, are you okay? Are you, you done? You, if you're done, you go back to the hotel and I'll finish. And I'll be like, oh, thank God I'm done. I can't. <laughs> I, and vi vice versa too, right? Like Kim is Kim is front of house for us, right? She's a, she, as you can see, she's incredible in front of a crowd. Um, and so it's like we we lean on each other for our strengths, and we shore up, yeah. we shore each other up for our weaknesses. And that's how we write too. Yeah. Like we, I, I do the stuff that I'm good at when we write. She does the stuff that she's good at. Like I come from a screenwriting mm -hmm. background. So dialogue and pacing is my specialty. Geely comes from a more traditional book writing background. So interiority, mm -hmm. painting the picture, structure, that's the stuff that she, she's really great at. I'll turn in pages that all look like a script. There's a whole bunch of dialogue. I'm like, this is a great right. conversation. She's like, not a book ma'am where are they what are they seeing how do they get from a to b and you know conversely sometimes i'll look at some of her dialogue and be like they're 17 not 40. Right. <laughs> <Accurate. laughs> that's so real though because you gotta watch that you get so into it and then it's like oh wait i'm i now that's me speaking and not nelly <laughs> or lenny or three or whoever the case may be. So that makes sense. I love that y'all play into that as opposed to, because I feel like sometimes you worry about like, okay, this is going to be the girl band that like starts off and then ego gets in the way and, and you're not playing to your strengths anymore, you know? So how do y'all navigate? I, it sounds like you navigated by just playing to your strengths and really trusting the other person where their strengths are. Yeah. I don't, I don't know that ego has ever been part of our relationship. Like we accept each other for exactly who we are. We, mm -hmm. we love each other for exactly who we are, like warts and all, you know what I mean? It's, mm -hmm. it's not that I'm, I'm like, I am perfect. Of course she loves me. Um, but uh, like, we just kind of meet each other where we are and we never ask for more. And that makes it real easy to set ego aside. Yeah. yeah. We're both like, you know, even though we are, um, big personalities, if you will, we're, mm -hmm. we're both exceptionally logical. 
and we're just like does does this make where does this make sense in this moment where also does it make sense in the grand scheme of things and that's kind of how we operate and I think we know that we're better together like we always jokingly say we call we call ourselves the literary Wu-Tang because we're like we think of ourselves, um, we think of ourselves as a group who will eventually do solo projects, but we'll always work together. We'll always write together. We'll always have stories together. But then, you know, we'll, we'll break out and, you know, old Ghostface Killer there, she'll have an album. And, you know, I've, you know I'm ODB, I'll have an album, you know, and, and go on from there. Well, Gil, we should do albums. Sorry. <laughs> I was about to say, so that's that's gonna be the next that's gonna be the next frontier for y'all. I feel like we would all love that. Um, I, we need to hear the the stage names then. So please work on those and get back to us so that we can start standing um, those new stage names. But but we're about to close. Um, if there are any final questions, please 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 drop them in the comment section. I want to make sure that everybody feels heard before we do get to my last question. People are asking for social media and where to find y'all. Um, so please, can you both share um, where to best follow you and keep up with your work and what is next for you? Uh, I am most active on Instagram or TikTok. I'm really geely on both of them. I'm nominally on Twitter, but I'm not my, I was not my best self on Twitter. So I, it's like updates, all nets. That's, that's not my milieu, if you will. Um, <laughs> and I can't talk about what's next for me yet, but follow me on Instagram someday. I'll be allowed to. <laughs> So you it's better really, follow me. <laughs> like it's what's next for her is super big. Um, I know it's it's killing me to keep the secret. I'm like, oh, I don't want to <laughs> Jesus, why you listening? Um, <laughs> uh, I um I also am on Twitter here, there, and everywhere, mostly announcements. But if you want to know announcements and updates and stuff, I'm on uh, Twitter as Kim Latrice Jones. But I also spend most of my time on the TAC. Um, and I am also on Instagram. And both on Instagram and TikTok, I'm Kimberly Latrice Jones. And what is next for me is I'm writing proposals with Geely so we can have more books together out there in the world. And I also have um, an adult nonfiction that's an extension of my video called How we can win that is coming out January 18th. Yes. You have to pre-order it. If you have not pre-ordered it, I'm sure Brave and Kind can get it. And you must because it's phenomenal. Not yeah, I'm gonna tell you like if it's any reflection of the original How We Can Win video, then 2.2 million people at least um, need to be pre-ordering it because I'm sure it's going to be so, so power packed. Yeah. And follow, follow all of the instances of Joe can give it to you for Georgia Center for the book because more than likely I'll probably be doing some kind of launch event with them for it in January. So right. they will have updates on like what that's, you know, gonna look like and stuff. Oh, you know what? We always forget too. We have a short story in a young adult anthology together coming mm. out in January. It's called Game On. It's edited by Laura Silverman. So, mm -hmm. it, and it is fun. It's like a little bit of a depart. Everyone's always like, you two write books about race relations in America. Y'all are silly. Um, are the we, <laughs> we got to indulge our fun side a little bit in this story. So game on. Yes, yeah, for that. Because y'all are multi-hyphenates. You are multi-talented and you shouldn't box yourself in and you shouldn't feel boxed in. And I'm excited to see those silly sides. Um, we all deserve to be a little bit, you know, more out there tapping into our childlike selves. Because if not, then what do we do it all for, right? So um, love, love that. Okay, final, final question to close out. Can you each share one takeaway that you want readers to have from this book? I'm going to go first because Geely has a really good one that I think should <laughs> as it that should be the benediction if you will yeah, um yeah. biggest church <laughs> Four to the God. shoot um my uh, the one thing that I would want to tell kids you know to to think about is that like whatever you're dealing with today think about something you were dealing with a year ago and ask yourself how much of an effect is it having on your life right now? Do you still care? Are you still upset about it? Is it still bothering you? And if the answer is no, then give yourself some grace and a break and know that this thing you're dealing with today will feel like that year ago thing very soon. Wow, yeah. 
Mine is, especially for teens, right? But this is applicable to everybody. We live in a time where we are, we're all public figures to some degree or another. And all the things that we do are extremely available for public dissection. Um, and mistakes seem to have monumental repercussions. But I want teens to remember that we are all more than our worst mistakes. And that's not to say that we get a pass or that there aren't consequences for our actions, but there is a road to redemption if you are willing to do the work and you are at all times more than your worst mistake. Mm, oh my gosh, that, that was a great way to close us out. Thank you both. Thank you, Gilly. Thank you, Kimberly. Please get your books if you have not already pre-ordered. Links have been dropped. Um, and I'm going to pass it to Joe to close out this space. But thank you all so much for being a part and for allowing me to be a part. Before we go, can I just say, if you're not following Bria Baker online, you must and you need to go read her bio. When we say hope looks like the future, we don't say that to pass the buck from our generation needing to do the work, but we say it because of people like Bria who are the young people who are the voices leading the way. And if you're not following her, it's your homework now. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you for doing this with us. An honor. honor. Well, Thank you, ladies. That was, of course, spectacular. I was not on screen the entire time, and thank goodness, because I was laughing here in my office. Um, but, you know, I, I think all powerful lessons need a little bit of humor, um, and they learn a little better taking the serious stuff with a little bit of laughter as well. Don't forget, I would like to thank Brave and Kind for being our bookseller tonight. Thank you so much, Bunny and Melissa, for all you do. They are, of course, black owned and mom operated. So do purchase your copies from them. They also have received the lovely gold little medallion stickers for the Georgia Center for the Book for I'm Not Dying With You Tonight. So if you get a copy of that from them, it will come with that Books All Young Georgians Should Read sticker. Bria, thank you so much for leading our discussion tonight. And as always, thank you, Kim and Gilly for being the wonderful people and authors you are. And thank you to all of the writing community. I saw you out there in the chat, Shelly and Myra for joining us this evening and supporting your fellow authors. That is a completely important thing in this day and age, as well as supporting our black authors because black voices matter, women's voices matter and black lives matter. Thank you all for joining us so very, very much. And we will see you again very soon. Have a wonderful evening.